Charles Dickens wrote in his short story, The Long Voyage, See the Halswell, East Indiaman outward bound, driving madly on a January night towards the rocks near Seacombe, on the island of Purbeck. The description of her loss, familiar to me from my early boyhood, seems to be read aloud as she rushes to her destiny. For Dickens, the Halswell was a vessel to express final regrets and a contemplation of a new year. But at one time, it had been the pride of the British East India Company. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the fatal cave of the Halswell? Here we are. Enjoy! The 786-ton Halswell was an impressively large ship for her time when she was launched in 1778. The Halswell was built to replace a decommissioned East India Company ship, the Ashburn, when she was sent to the breakers. Indeed, the Halswell was built using the rib timbers that had been salvaged from the Ashburn when she was broken up. The timbers from the Ashburn also came with the ship's commander, Captain Pierce who was appointed to take command of the Halswell on her completion. He was a man who was well-respected in the company, a fact that was reflected by his new post on one of their larger and finest ships. The East India Company also put onto the ship the best sailors and officers they could find. The Halswell was ordered by the company to head to Gravesend and begin loading for her third voyage on the 16th of November, 1785. The ship was still considered in good repair. Another voyage to Bengal would not put any undue strain on her. Most company ships could manage at least four or five voyages before needing to be retired or sold. Captain Pierce, therefore, loaded his ship for his voyage. He also had passengers to bring on board, some of them personal. This time, he was bringing his two daughters, as well as two of their female cousins. Coming on board were also soldiers who had been recruited to join the company's forces in Asia, a daughter of another company captain, the sister of an officer in Madras, a woman who had been born in Madras but sent to England for an education, and a man who was going to Asia to collect some money he had left there. In total, it was thought that the ship carried between 240 and 300 people on board as she began her voyage. The ship sailed through the Downs on the 1st of January, 1786, the start of what could be expected to be a long voyage. Unfortunately, the weather had turned against them. By the next day, and by that evening, they were forced to anchor due to the heavy snow, which would prove to be only the start of a heavy winter gale coming from the east. By the morning of the 3rd of January, it was becoming clear that the storm was too strong for the anchor to hold them, and the ship was in danger. Captain Pierce had the cables cut, and the ship headed further from the land to avoid being driven ashore. They sailed down the channel, but the wind changed direction and now began to come from the south, which placed the ship in danger again. The Halswell was forced to put on more sail due to the strong winds, in order to keep the ship off of the rocks, and this put additional pressure on the ship's house plugs. That the house holes of a ship were a vulnerability was already well known. In rough weather, the water coming in through the holes could severely compromise a ship. The Halswell, as a modern ship of her era, had new improved hose plugs that were put in from inside the ship. This simply resulted in the plugs being washed into the ship instead, however, and the hose bags washed away. Soon, the gun deck of the Halswell was awash. Not only that, but a leak was soon discovered as well. The Halswell had five feet of water in her hold, and the pumps were put to work. By two in the morning of Wednesday the 4th, they had attempted to furl the sails, but failed due to how rough the winter storm was. Instead, they chose to cut away the mizzenmast in the hopes that it would reduce the strain on the ship. It failed in any noticeable results, however, and the well now showed that the Halswell had seven feet of water in her hold. <laughs> 
it seemed that she was fighting a losing battle. East Indiamen were built to hold the greatest amount of cargo, but this came at the cost of maneuverability, especially in rougher seas. They now cut away the mainmast as well, but this was not done without incident. Over the side, along with the mainmast, went the ship's coxswain and four of the sailors who were not seen again. Without the masts, the ship was able to turn into a more favorable position, and the pumps finally gained some on the water that had been flooding the ship. The wind also seemed to have lessened and changed direction to the west. The crew got to work erecting a jury mainmast, and after setting their course towards Portsmouth, they also began to set up a jury mizzenmast. The storm was not done with the hulls well yet, however, and at no point were they able to stop pumping. It would later be said by many accounts of the wreck that a majority of the crew refused to even go on deck at a certain point, and they certainly did not aid with the pumping. The officers and soldiers were forced to take the pumps, while the sailors remained below in their hammocks. This would later be disputed by two of the officers, who publicly contradicted these claims. They spotted Portsmouth around noon on Thursday the 5th, but now there was a gale-strength wind coming from the south again, and the ship was no longer able to head west due to the adverse winds. They turned east, hoping to shelter in Studland Bay, but the Hallswell continued to be driven towards the lee shore. On seeing Alban's head a mile and a half to leeward, they furled the sails and dropped the bower anchor, which only held for an hour before it began to drag. They then dropped the sheet anchor, but the wind increased and this too dragged for two hours. The shore in front of them was rocky and sharp, giving them no hope of driving the ship into a sandy beach, and the sea was breaking over the ship with increasing violence. In this circumstance, Captain Pierce called the second mate of the ship, Mr. Meriton, and asked what he thought of the chances of saving the lives aboard the Haswell were. He, at this point, had all of the female passengers, including his daughters and nieces, huddled around him in the cuddy. Second mate Meriden was blunt in his answer that he did not see a chance for them, since the ship was likely to strike rocks at any second, and their only hope would be to last on the wreck until daylight. Captain Pierce ordered that the ship's cannons should be fired, to alert those on shore of their danger, but it was a pitch-black stormy night. Help was not likely. They did discuss the possibility of boats, but the weather was so foul, and the chance that the boats would be smashed against the rocks so high, that there seemed to be little point in launching them. It was agreed by the men that if they were able to launch the longboat at least, the female passengers and the officers should be able to get a place in that. This would prove to be a pipe dream. Second mate Meriden would seek out Captain Pierce a second time in the cuddy at two in the morning on Friday the 6th. This time, with both men aware of the ship being only two minutes away from disaster. This time, Captain Pierce's concern was only for the women on board, a majority of whom were related to him. He asked if second mate Meriden could think of any way to at least save them. Meriden simply answered that it was impossible. With this, Captain Pierce embraced his daughters and announced his intention to go down with them. Almost immediately after he said this, the ship struck the rocks with such violence that the heads of the people in the cuddy hit the planks of the ceiling. The ship was now at the mercy of the waves, which continued to batter her against the rocks until she fell broadside towards the shore. There was little hope on that shore for the people on board of the Hallswell. The ship had struck near Seacombe, where the shore was a cliff, the foot of which the Hallswell was being beaten against. Second mate Meriton gave the best advice he could offer to the men on the deck. Everyone should go to the part of the ship closest to the rocks and try to climb onto the rocks if they got the chance. It was his hope that the ship would last until dawn without breaking up and some of the people on shore would see them. What he was not aware of, due to the dark night, was that the Hallswell was in the mouth of a sea cave, the overhang of which would prevent anyone standing on the top of the cliff from seeing them. Second mate Meriton returned once again to the cuddy, where all of the officers had now also gathered, now that there was nothing else to do. 
All of the passengers had also gathered, including some of the wives of the soldiers. It was estimated that 50 people managed to fit in the space, with Captain Pierce seated in the wreckage of his cabin, still hugging his daughters. Meriton left the cabin for a while to get the women some oranges because he saw that they were exhausted. He brought the promised basket of fruit, but what he had seen as he walked across the deck had troubled him. The ship was clearly going to pieces. The planks were buckling and the ship had split amidships. Deciding that, no matter how much he hoped for it, the ship was not going to last until daylight. After delivering the fruit, he joined those who were trying to reach the rocks. Using a lantern that was handed up through the cuddy skylight, he found a spar that he tried to climb along, but he fell a painful distance. Before he could try to orient himself, a wave washed him off the rock he had landed on. Meriton was forced to swim until another wave came and washed him to the back of the sea cave. Here he grabbed a hold of a rock which he clung to until a sailor, who had managed to find a good foothold, grabbed his hand and pulled him up past the reach of the waves. In the cuddy of the hall's well, the third mate, a Mr. Rogers, stayed with the captain and the passengers for another twenty minutes. The absence of second mate Meriton caused a good deal of concern for the female passengers, who felt that if he had just remained in the cabin, he would have been safe. The first large wave that struck the ship after he left had the women determined that the second mate had drowned. Rogers offered to check and see what had happened, but the women insisted that he stay in the cabin with them, determined that anyone on deck would meet with the same imagined fate of Meriton. Finally, Captain Pierce and third mate Roger took a lamp and went to the stern gallery to see what the situation was like. All that met their light was the high, black cave wall, though they could not see the cave itself and the hope that it offered. Captain Pierce once again asked if there was any way that his daughters and nieces could be saved, but third mate Rogers also could not think of a way, not with his own fate so uncertain. With this, Captain Pierce determined to sit with his daughters, but other people in the cabin were not so inclined to await their fate. Mr. Schultz, one of the passengers, and Midshipman McManus asked Rogers what they should do, and Rogers decided it was time to leave the cuddy. The first mate expressed no desire to save himself. Captain Pierce was his uncle, and the female passengers were mostly cousins of his. It didn't feel right for him to escape the fate of the Hallswell without them. Rogers, accompanied by Schultz and McManus, climbed up to the upper quarter gallery on the ship's poop, with the fifth mate, Mr. Daniel, following close after. From here, they watched as another enormous wave hit the ship, and with this, the roundhouse gave away. And other than a few shouts and shrieks, this would be the last they would know of the people who they had left behind in the cuddy. As the wave that smashed the roundhouse broke, the four men grabbed onto a hen coop, and the wave carried them to a rock, which they arrived on, battered and bruised, but still alive. On the rock, there were 27 men, but it was low tide, and they knew that as the tide rose, they would be washed off. About a quarter of their number, including Rogers and Daniel, managed to climb onto narrow rock shelves around the cave, which were high enough that they did not wash away as the tide came in. Other survivors of the wreck had also gathered here, clinging to the edges of the cave. They also were reunited with Meriton, who they were close enough to speak with. For Rogers, this was a particular relief, since the two men were close friends. They had in fact survived a different shipwreck on another East Indiaman just before this. Both men had only been home for 25 days before starting this voyage. The men in the cave were wet, tired, and cold, shivering as they tried to hold on to the rocks through the January night. There was little hope for those still on the ship. They watched as the waves continued to smash over her, breaking her apart until they could no longer see the silhouette of the ship at all. As the night went on, not everyone was able to hold on until daylight, and they let go of their hold, falling into the sea. About three hours after the Hallswell broke apart completely, dawn broke. But the light of the day brought little cheer. 
The overhang of the cave mouth would not only stop anyone from seeing them, it also prevented any ropes from being lowered to them. The hull's well was completely shattered and gone. There was no chance of people on land seeing the wrecked ship and finding them that way. Their only chance of escape was to follow the thin shelf that ran around the edge of the cave and outside of the cliff face as a means to escape, though it was described as only being the width of a hand. The ship's quartermaster, Mr. Thompson, managed the climb of a hundred feet up the cliff face, closely followed by the ship's cook. It must have been a difficult climb, since everyone's limbs and extremities were described as being numbed by cold after their night in the cave. The two men, on reaching the top of the cliff, then headed to the closest house they could see, which turned out to be the house of Mr. Garland, steward of the Purbeck Quarries. On hearing the news, he immediately gathered as many of the quarrymen as he could, and they headed to the cliff carrying ropes. A few men had managed to pull themselves up the cliff face after the quartermaster and cook had left, though no one could explain how it was managed since it seemed to those on shore to be impossible. At first, ropes were simply lowered, but it was too hard for the men below to crawl out of the cave far enough to grab them in their weakened state. Second mate Meriton was pulled up in this way, but only as the rock below his feet crumbled, and he nearly fell into a still angry sea and rocks. Instead, an iron bar was driven into the ground by the quarrymen, who formed a human chain to pull up those who could grab the rope they lowered, a loop in it so the people in the cave could simply tighten it around themselves. It was dangerous work. The quarrymen attached themselves to the rope they had lowered, and attached it to the iron bar in case they were dragged over the edge of the cliff. Not everyone in the cave was able to secure themselves to the rope due to exhaustion and numbed hands. Mr. Daniels, the fifth mate, was among those who fell while being pulled up. The quarrymen were able to save about 18 people from the cave in total, though three passed away from exposure shortly after being pulled up. They were given something to drink and some gingerbread to strengthen them, and then sent to a nearby farmhouse to recover further. One of the soldiers was not saved from the cave until the next morning, having spent two miserable nights there clinging to the wall. More help arrived as news spread in the community of the tragedy that had occurred. Along the coast, more survivors were found. Some people had clung to wreckage until they had reached a part of the coast where the cliff face was easier to climb. About 40 men were pulled up on ropes after they were found to have climbed up part of the cliff face and then gotten stuck. In total, there would be 74 survivors out of the 240 people who had been on board when she had departed on her voyage. It was estimated that at least 50 people who had escaped the initial wreck had not managed to hold out for rescue. Mr. Meriton and Mr. Rogers, as the highest-ranking officers of the ship left, headed to London to bring news of the ship's destruction to the company. As they traveled, they spread news about the wreck hoping that soldiers and sailors who would be following after them would be met with kindness if it was known that they had been recently shipwrecked. The warning was merited, since the sailors and soldiers made their own way back to London in a group traveling on foot. A group of 70 rough and battered men traveling on foot towards London could have been suspected of something far more sinister than simply having been recently shipwrecked. The Crown Inn in Dorchester, was particularly generous, housing all of the shipwrecked men in his house and then giving them money as they left to make the rest of their travel more comfortable. The Hallswell was described as the most complete destruction of a ship most people had ever heard of. Pieces of the ship, as well as victims of her sinking, washed on shore up and down the coast. Captain Pierce was found in Christ Church, 20 miles from the wreck, and laid to rest there. Next to his grave are those of one of his daughters, one of the female passengers, and Schultz, who had tried to escape the wreck with Rogers. Up and down the coast, new graves were dug as people washed on shore, and people were able to grasp the magnitude of the disaster that had struck. Nor was the Hallswell the only ship that had sank in the storm. 
It had not only been a blizzard, but it had also had thunder and lightning. One ship returning from the Mediterranean was struck by lightning and destroyed while within sight of London. Most of what remained of the Hallswell was small pieces of the ship which were salvaged by locals as they washed on shore and were added to household goods. In 1967, divers found what remained of the ship in the shape of a cannon, cannonball, some coins, and the pintle, which at one point had been the ship's rudder. It is little to remind people of a ship which was once a point of pride in the East India Company. For more information, please see A History of Shipwrecks and Disasters at Sea by Cyrus Redding, published 1833, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.